An Air Canada Boeing 767 cruises along nicely at 41,000 feet when suddenly and out of nowhere they run out of fuel. Now, how is the flight crew going to get this aircraft safely down on the ground and what led up to this? This is the fascinating story of the Gimli Glider, one of my all-time favorite aviation incident and accident stories, so make sure you stay tuned. <laughs> This video is brought to you together with Skillshare. Now, I know that you, just like me, are lifelong learners, that you're curious and you want to try to find new sources of information. Skillshare is a great tool for this. They are an online learning platform with thousands of high quality video courses in pretty much anything that you can imagine. Now, I've used it myself to try to improve my delivery to you. You know, uh, there's a great course with Sorel Amore, which tells you exactly how to do that. But there's loads of other courses as well, like professional photography, for example, or how you can use your own simulator to prepare yourself for your PPL license. If you're interested in that, the 1000 first of you who uses this link here below will get a free trial of Skillshare. And if you find that you like it, which I'm sure you will, you can sign up and it's very affordable. It's less than $10 per month. So. Sign up, start learning today. Okay guys, so today we're gonna to be talking about the Gimli Glider. And like I said in the beginning of this video, this is one of my all time favorite stories because it has so many different components to it. Now, as always, when I'm talking about incidents and accidents, I'm basing this on the final report and all of my sources that I've been using, you can find in the description of the video if you want to read them through yourself. But in order to understand how these guys could run out of fuel at 41,000 feet, we have to go back a little bit in time. And we have to look at the Boeing 767 that was involved in this flight. So the 767, when this happened, this was in uh, July, the 23rd of July, 1983, was a fairly new type for Air Canada, okay? And something that's going to become really important to this story is the fact that Canada, as a country, had decided to go over from the Imperial units to the metric system. Now, the 767 was the first aircraft in the Air Canada fleet that used kilograms on their fuel gauges. All right? Before that, everything had been in pounds. Now, this was obviously communicated, there was some training material, but there was still a little bit of uneasiness amongst the flight crew about how to do these kind of conversions. However, it wasn't really an issue because you had your flight plan, the flight plan was in kilos, and then you could just compare what you had in kilos towards what you had on your fuel gauges, and that was fine, right? Now, this particular aircraft, um, had had some issues with its fuel gauges before. And on the night before the accident flight, on the 22nd of July, 1983, the on-duty engineer came on board the flight deck to find that the fuel gauges were blank, all right? They did not work. But he had seen this before, and he knew that there were two input channels to the fuel gauges. So there are two independent channels, that verifies how much fuel there is in the tanks. There's a center tank and there are two main tanks in the wings. And those two channels send their information to the gauges. Now it turns out that if those two signals are different or one is not working, then the whole system blanks, right? It stops working. The engineer knew that if he could find the faulty signal and isolate that, then the system would work again. So he started checking it. He found out that it was the uh, second channel that wasn't working. So he disconnected the second channel, he pulled the circuit breaker and he put a little yellow collar on it to, to show that this had been done. When he did that, the fuel gauges came back on. The system was operational, right? However, if you've been following my podcast, you know that when we talk about critical systems in the airline industry, there has to be what we call redundancy. That means that there cannot be just one critical system relying on one source. So if you have this kind of problem where the two channels, one was faulty and only one was providing information, then that needs to be verified. So the procedure is that you now need to do something called a drop stick test. 
That is basically that in the wings and under the uh, central tank, there are these sticks okay, that are connected to floats inside of the tank. And if you turn them around and open them, they fall down and they show how many centimeters of fuel there is at that particular station in the tank. Now you have several of these drip sticks on each wing. And when you do a drip stick test, which takes a fair while, it takes a good maybe 45 minutes to an hour to do, then you see, all right, I have this many centimeters on these stations out on the tank. You take that into a manual and you check, and that will give you the amount of fuel you have in the tank. All right. So the engineers did this check and they could quickly verify that what was on the fuel gauges in the cockpit corresponded to what was in the tanks according to the drip test. Now, taking over the aircraft on the accident day uh, was a captain called Veer. All right? Captain Veer was briefed by the uh, engineers that they had this issue, uh, but in the briefing, he misunderstood it. He thought that the aircraft had come in with this failure from a previous flight. Right? He didn't understand that he was the first captain that was actually flying with this failure. Didn't really matter. Um, they decided on how much fuel they needed to take up. They verified how much fuel they had in the tanks. And then they calculated how much more fuel they would need to uplift. And then they verified the actual amount of fuel after the uplift using the drip stick procedure. Right? This was all good. The flight then pushed back. It flew a two-leg flight from Edmonton to Ottawa and then into Montreal. And in Montreal, there was a scheduled crew change, right? So during that crew change, Captain Veer met up with the next captain that's going to take over the flight. And this is Captain Pearson, right? And they talked a little bit on the, on the parking lot. And Captain Veer told Captain Pearson that they've had an issue with the fuel indicating system. Right? And that there was a drip stick procedure needed. This is something that happens very rarely. So they would have had a bit of a discussion about it. Now the issue here, and what seems to have been the issue here, is that Captain Pearson misunderstood Captain Veer. Captain Pearson thought that the failure was a complete failure of the indication system. Okay? That the indicators was blank, and because of that you needed to do a drip stick test. All right? So this is what he understood. Unbeknownst to these two captains, while they were out there talking, another engineer has now entered into the cockpit of the 767 in question. Now this engineer is looking through the tech log and he sees the tech log entry from the previous engineer and he doesn't really understand it. So he decides that he wants to do his own check of the system. So he proceeds by pushing in the circuit breaker. When he does so, indication blanks again. And then he does something called a byte test, which is built-in test equipment. And you have byte tests for several systems. It's a computer test that runs a self-test on the system. And this came out as failed, right? This is what he expected as well. So he decides that he, did, he doesn't really like this, okay? He thinks that the second channel should be changed. So he calls up the maintenance control center and asks to get a spare to, to change the system. It turns out that there's no spares for this particular problem. They're gonna to have to wait until they're back again in Edmonton for the night change in order to find the spare and to change the channel. Now, while he's talking to Main Troll here, he gets a second call and that's from the fueler. The fueler needs help to do the drip test because you need an engineer to do that. And here is where the next issue happens, right? Because he now forgets to pull out the circuit breaker again. That would have, if he would have done that, that would have reset the system and the fuel gauges would come back. But the fuel gauges stay completely hidden. Okay, so as the engineer now goes out and starts dealing with the drip test, Captain Pearson comes into the cockpit. And remember, he has already had the misunderstanding here. So he looks and he sees what he's expecting to see, which is no fuel indication. He looks at the tech log. The tech log says that there are issues with the fuel indication system. Okay. He looks at the circuit breaker and he sees the yellow collar and he assumes that it has been pulled. The problem is that the yellow collar is there but the circuit breaker has been pushed back in again. So you can see how his kind of confirmation bias, his bias to how the situation should look is now affecting what he is actually seeing. Okay. 
he takes up the MEL, that's the minimum equipment list. Now that is a list that we use when something is broken aboard the aircraft. Because we have so much redundancy in all of the different systems, it means that under certain circumstances, certain things can be broken. Remember how I told you about the one channel being broken that they have to do a drip test in order to get redundancy. So he looks at the MEL and he finds something curious. Namely, the MEL states that you are allowed to fly with one out of the three indicators inoperative. Okay, so if you have two working fuel gauges and one is not working, you're allowed to dispatch provided that you've done a drip test. However, it also clearly then shows that you're not allowed to dispatch if there is no fuel indication. Right, this is forbidden. Now, here is where um, a bit of the, the, the kind of backstory of the 767 comes in because the 767 is a fairly new aircraft and the MEL is constantly being rewritten and rechanged. Okay, and this has led to a feeling amongst the pilots that if there is an MEL restriction, you can always contact Maintrol, their maintenance control center, and they have a more detailed MEL that they can go into and override the MEL that the pilots have. Now, this is a faulty impression, but it's still there anyway. Now, in the, in the interviews after the accident, Captain Pearson says that he talked to some of the maintenance personnel there, and they said that this rule had been overwritten. All right, that you could dispatch without working fuel gauges. Um, none of the maintenance personnel says that that conversation ever took place. But nonetheless, the Captain Pearson is now looking at the MEL and he knows that the previous air crew has flown with this failure. Right? He doesn't understand that the previous air crew came in with a very different failure than what he is seeing right now. So he decides to override it. Right? He decides that he has enough reason to believe that his aircraft is safe to fly without fuel indications, providing that a proper drip test has been done. This is a major mistake, okay? And a major break of rules should be said as well. Anyway, um, the drip test is being done. And of course, this aircraft came in with a certain amount of fuel in their tanks. Now they need a minimum of 22,300 kilos in order to do the return flight from Montreal via Ottawa to Edmonton. So they need to figure out how much fuel to uplift. The fueler wants the quantity in liters. So when the drip test come back, um, they go into the manual and they see that on board they have 7,682 liters. But they now need to convert that into kilos because that's what the flight plan is in. And here is where the next major mistake is made. So to convert liters into pounds, you have a conversion factor of 1.77. But to convert it from liters to kilos, it is 0 0.803. So what they now continue to do is that take 7,682 times 1.77. That is 13,597. Kilos is what they think they have. It's actually pounds. Then they take the minimum fuel required for the flight, which is 22,300, minus the 13,597, which gives 8,703 kilos, which is incorrect. And they then decide to convert that into liters by dividing it with 1.77. So 8,703 divided by 1.77 is 4,917 liters. They pass that on to the fueler. The fueler says, well, why don't we just round that up to 5,000 liters, shall we? Okay, they say, better safe than sorry. And they upload 5,000 liters. Now, what they should have done, all right, was that they should have taken the 7,682 liters times 0 0.803. That gives 6,169 kilos. This is the correct conversion. Then, the minimum fuel to dispatch, 22,300, minus this 6,169, gives 16,131 kilos needed, right? Then converted those kilos over to liters. 16,131 divided with 0 0.803 gives 20,088 liters. So they should have taken 20,088, they took 5,000 liters, and that's because they were using 
the wrong conversion method. But of course, you know, if this would have happened with the previous failure in, they would have uplifted it, they would have looked at the fuel gauges, and they would have realized that we need 20,300, we have like 8,000 on board. But since they couldn't see the gauges, this was not done. The aircraft boarded its passengers, 61 passengers. Uh, they took off from the initial flight then to, from Montreal to Ottawa. Uh, in Ottawa, they did another drip test, but still used the wrong conversion method. And because they did that, they still got the kind of wrong numbers up. It just looks like, yeah, everything is fine. This is a, exactly according to what we were expecting. And then they took off towards Edmonton. So the takeoff, climb out, perfectly normal. Climb up to 41,000 feet and after a while, at about 8 o'clock local time, the first indication that something is wrong is happening. Okay, And that is that they get an indication of a low pressure on the left-hand fuel system. This worries them a bit. Okay, because they know that they have an issue with the fuel indication. So they decide to divert to Winnipeg, which is about 120 miles away. They initiate the uh, descent towards Winnipeg, the descent to 35,000 feet. And during the descent, they get the next indication of low pressure on the right hand side. This is now very quickly followed by the engine failure on engine number one and engine number two. No more engines. So the aircraft is now completely dark. All right. There is a standby electric system that will give them some very limited standby instruments. Their primary displays are not working. Um, they don't have a vertical speed indicator. And of course, when you're gliding the aircraft, you want to have a vertical speed indicator in order to calculate how far you can go. First Officer Quintal sits and talks to air traffic control calls out the Mayday, obviously, communicates and asks them to give him a distance reading. So he can calculate how much time is going by, how much distance they're going, and how much they're sending. And from that, they calculate that they have a glide ratio of about 1 to 12. So sitting at 35,000 feet, it's about 65 miles to go to Winnipeg, and it's about 45 miles to go to a little airfield called Gimli. Now, they know about Gimli because first of the Quintal used to be in the Canadian Air Force and he was flying out of Gimli. But what they don't know is that Gimli has been decommissioned, right? It's no longer an active base. In fact, the, uh, there is a, a club, a driving club in Winnipeg who's using it to do drag races. And on this day, on the 23rd of July 1983, there is a big drag race taking place in Gimli. They don't know about this. It's a nice day. They see the airfield, Gimli, quite far out. And something that's also playing in their favor is that Captain Pearson is an accomplished glider pilot. He's very, very skilled at gliding. So this sitting and flying without engines is not something that is completely new to him. He has reduced the speed back of the aircraft to about 220 knots, which he thinks is the best gliding speed, more or less. And he's now aiming towards Gimli. Also something that's worth knowing here is that the 767 requires hydraulics in order to drive its flight controls. All right? It's not like the 737 which has some wires that goes out and you can actually fly it without hydraulics. No, this is just two big rudder surfaces. So in order to provide uh, electrical power to drive the hydraulics in a situation like this, something called a ram air turbine has dropped out. It's a little propeller that is providing uh, electrical energy in order to, to you know, control the aircraft. So they still have control of the aircraft, they have limited instrumentation. They talk to air traffic control, they've sent on the information to the um, cabin crew. The cabin crew is now doing an amazing job in the back by informing the passengers about the potential emergency landing and also calming passengers down. This is something they're going to be commended for later on. Anyway, they're now descending down and they realize that from 30 5,000 feet, if they're flying 45 miles, they're going to be quite high. They discussed the possibility of maybe doing a 360 turn, you know, but they didn't know exactly how much altitude they would lose by that, um, and they didn't want to risk not being able to reach Gimli. So instead, Captain Pearson takes out a little, you know, knowledge from his gliding days, and he says, why don't we do a forward side slip? 
A forward side slip is something you do on smaller aircraft, on Cessnas, Pipers or gliders. And what you do is you basically fly with opposite rudders. So in the case of Pearson sitting on the left side, he would probably have pressed the right rudder in order to move the nose to the right and then put left aileron in in order to keep the track going. So this way he can look out through his side window and see the, um, the airport and judge whether or not he is high or low. Now we don't do that on swept wing larger air transport airplanes and that's because there is going to be a lot of turbulence coming off the body and that turbulence can go into the engine and if you have two engines running that might actually cause the engine to stall and you could end up at a low speed situation with a suddenly stalling engine and that could get you into a really hard place when it comes to controlling the aircraft. But also something that this crew has not thought about is the fact that when they go into a side slip the airstream over the ram air turbine is also interrupted. So the ram air turbine does not get as much airflow over it. It slows down. That means that they now have less hydraulic power available. And they notice this when they try to straighten the aircraft out. That it is much, much harder to move. And that's because of this. Anyway, they now continue towards the airfield. And they realize as well that they cannot get the flaps and the slats out because they require a fully working hydraulic system. They don't have that. So they're sitting at this around 200 knots, which is very, very high airspeed. They tried to extend landing gear. Now the landing gear also requires hydraulics to work. Um, first off, the Quintal is trying to find the quick reference handbook. Um, he cannot find the correct checklist, so he just reaches over for the emergency extension. Now I've done a video about how we do emergency extension in the 737. 737 you basically have to open the door in the floor and pull and kind of release the uplock for each of the landing gears. It is a slightly different system on the 767 but it works essentially the same by letting the gear gravity fall out into the airstream. Now this works fine for the main landing gear but as the nose gear is extending it goes out but it doesn't lock in the position. So the nose gear is now unsafe which is going to turn out to be actually a fairly good thing. They're getting closer towards the runway and as they get close to the runway they start realizing that there's loads of people here. At the far end of the runway there's a drag race going on, there's loads of people there. And the issue here is of course that without engines this aircraft is almost completely quiet. No one hears this aircraft coming in. Okay? The kids look up and they see this enormous 767 barreling down on them and in the interviews afterwards the flight crew said that they were so close to these kids that they could see the terror in their faces. The kids are okay though. They land and as the nose gear touched down because it's unsafe it just falls back in again. The nose falls down and it starts grinding across the runway. This provides a lot of braking for the aircraft. Uh, the flight crew put max manual braking on but because there's no anti-skid system working without the hydraulics working, what happens is that the gear just locks up and locking up at this speed, it just means that they blow out instantly. So now they have blown out tires and they're skidding down the runway towards the people at the far end. Um, along the runway, about halfway down or so, there are these guardrails that have been put up to basically to you know keep the public from the racers. And the flight crew managed to use a little bit of differential braking to kind of push the aircraft up against one of these guardrails to get further deceleration from that. And they managed to get the aircraft to a full stop. It gets quiet. The aircraft has landed successfully. Okay? No one is hurt. No one is dead. The cabin crew immediately begins an evacuation. Because the aircraft has been skidding across the, the runway, there's a little bit of smoke in the forward part of the aircraft. So most of the passenger goes towards the back in the overwings to try to get out. Now there's a little bit of an issue here because the nose obviously is sitting down on the runway, which means that the back of the aircraft, where the emergency exits are, are higher than normal. So the emergency escape slides are basically hanging almost vertical. And there are a few people who hurt themselves as they're basically jumping out on these very, very steep um, escape slides. But all, all in all, this is an amazing outcome. All right, they have taken a situation that was potentially catastrophic and they've turned it into something that is semi-good, okay? Now, 
the investigation into this revealed several things. First of all, the pilots were partially blamed for their inability to do the uh, fuel conversion using the correct numbers, but that was also put on the kind of shoulders of Air Canada because they hadn't properly trained the pilots, they hadn't properly communicated these changes specifically with the changes in roles from a three pilot cockpit with a flight engineer to a two pilot cockpit and also the ongoing changes from a uh, imperial to the metric system. Uh, there was talks about the lack of uh, spares, you know, if they would have had spares available this fault with the fuel gauges would have been fixed already and this would not have been a factor uh, and some other items as well. Uh, the captain, Captain Pearson, was demoted to first officer for six months. Um, the first officer Quintal was actually uh, suspended for two weeks and three of the maintenance engineers that was involved in this was also suspended. Now the flight crew did an appeal to this and they managed to appeal it successfully. They were put back into their flying positions and they continued to fly for many many years. And in fact in 1985 first officer uh, Quintal and Captain Pearson was awarded the Federación Aeronautic Internacionale Diploma for Outstanding Airmanship for the very first time. All right? The first time that this diploma was given out, it was given to this flight crew. So they were considered heroes. Now, I'm guessing that you guys have some questions about this. And maybe you have some suggestions about other incidents and accidents that I should be covering in this series. If you do, please go into the comment section below. I love hearing from you. I hope that I have earned a subscription from you. If you like this kind of content, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and that you've highlighted the notification bell so you know when I'm doing things like, you know, spontaneous live videos and stuff. If you want to talk directly to me or other aviation enthusiasts, then I highly recommend you to check out my Discord server, right? In the description of the video, there's an invite to my Discord server where you can chat with other people about loads of different topics and you can share pictures and other cool stuff. There's always something happening in the Discord server. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.